My mom was everything you could dream of. Sometimes I get told, you know, you look like Lisa, or maybe you act like Lisa. She was an amazing mom, amazing daughter, amazing sister. She was just an all around amazing person. I don't think my life will ever be normal with everything that has happened in my life. I think I'll always question if I'm safe and if I can trust people. There was 13 years where this case was not solved. I would love people to understand in a situation like this that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. This whole story, it, it's just too crazy. None of it could be real because it's too crazy. For Army recruits at Fort Lee, this day will shape the rest of their lives. They're about to begin officer training school. Among the trainees is Lisa Gadenzi. The 30-year-old has big plans. Lisa wanted to be a judge. They only take the brightest people out of the class. And she was happy that she was going into the service. By mid-morning, all the new officer trainees have reported to their barracks, all except one. Lisa did not show up for officer training school. The Army immediately classified her as AWOL. Being trained in officer training school would give her the opportunity to go to law school through the military and be an officer in a JAG Corps. It was her dream come true. She wanted to do her time in officer's training, and for us not to hear anything, nothing, we knew something happened at that point. I was Lisa's stepmother. I was married to her father, Joseph. I treated Lisa like she was my daughter. She was a daughter I never had. She grew up in New Jersey. Lisa grew up in an influential family, very well-to-do. Her father, Joe, was very well off with businesses. Joe had wig factories in Europe and multiple beauty shops in uh, across the United States. Had them for quite a few years. Lisa was very smart. Her and her sister went to Montessori. They went to school in a Rolls Royce. That's how Lisa was raised until the divorce. I don't think Lisa or her sister were happy with the divorce. They used to come to Atlantic City and visit their father in the summertime. Joe was a very doting father. Joe had told me they had a big pool in the backyard, and Lisa used to love to swim. At the age of three, she jumped in this pool and she started swimming. She was outgoing when I met her years earlier when she was 10. The older she got, the more ambitious Lisa got. But once she had the car accident, she became very self-conscious. As a result of that accident, she needed a special porcelain dental plate, and she had a lot of scarring on her face. She went through the windshield. And at the age of 16, going to high school, you know, that's uh, not good for your uh, ego. Going to school with new scars or bandages on your face and no teeth in the bottom of your mouth. When Lisa graduated from high school, she moved down to West Palm to be with her mother and her sister. They were living down in Florida at the time. She wound up getting a job in an auto body shop. Most women couldn't be bothered, but it didn't bother Lisa to get down and dirty, paint the car, sand the car down. She had no problem doing that. Lisa's working in the auto body shop, and who's working in there also is Jim. Jim was her boss. They started the date, and one thing led to another. After a whirlwind romance, 21-year-old Lisa and 24-year-old Jim Burdett get married in 1985. They welcome a baby girl named Leah a year later. Leah was born with cystic fibrosis. It's a lung disease that's incurable. Your lungs are filled with fluid. 
when Leah was diagnosed with it back then, they gave her a four to five year span of living. Over the years though, with her medications, her span of life is a lot longer now. It caused a lot of difficulties in the relationship between Lisa and Jim. All of her energy and her attention was focused on Leah and her education, and the marriage was over. They were not functioning as a married couple for a long time before they ultimately did get divorced in 1989. Lisa and Leah moved to Virginia, and that's when Lisa meets tow truck driver Lawrence Cadenzi. She thought he was good looking. He took her out to dinner. Lisa was, you know, smitten. Lawrence was very involved in the Mormon church, and they moved in together into a house that was rented to them by the bishop of that church. So it was a very quiet, religious, rural area. Once again, Lisa falls hard. Lisa said to me, guess what? And I knew what she was going to say, that she was pregnant. She was ecstatic. Lisa and Lawrence named their daughter Shelby. They marry shortly after. Lawrence was thrilled. He wanted a little boy, but she was a little girl, and he was tickled pink. Lisa was over the moon. She's a mother again. Now she has her two children. She's extremely happy. Despite having two kids, Lisa enlists in the Army in 1994. It was the first step towards her dream job. Lisa's goal was to be a lawyer and a judge. She was going to make that work by joining the Army, going to school, and becoming a JAG judge. The schedule is so demanding that Lisa sends eight-year-old Leah to Florida to live with her grandmother. Lawrence stays in Virginia with their daughter, two-year-old Shelby. Lisa's goal was to be a wife and a mother. She was going to make that work with Lawrence Cadenzi. The Cadenzis rent out their basement. Their tenant helps out with the cooking and cleaning while Lisa works and studies. A day passes, and there's still no sign of Lisa. Military police at Fort Lee start a search for the missing mom. The MPs showed up at Lawrence's house, and they also showed up at the mother's house in the Keys looking for Lisa. Lawrence filed a missing persons report on Lisa with the Caroline County Sheriff's Department. He told them that he had dropped Lisa off at the bus station in Richmond to go to officer training school and that was the last time he saw her. When deputies search Lisa's belongings, they find something that might explain her disappearance. Love letters, not addressed to Lawrence, but to a man named Israel. It appears from their letters that there is a budding romance between Lisa and Israel. Israel, you are still always on my mind. I look forward to sharing my life with you, but it is really hard having to wait. I have waited so long for happiness, and now I have finally found the man for me, and I can't be with him. I know we will have plenty of time to be together, but I hate wasting four months of my life without you. I have already wasted 30 years. Every night before I fall asleep, I think about laying in your arms. I miss going to sleep with you next to me. I don't ever want to be away from you for such a long time again. Good night, my love, Lisa. She didn't show up for training. Did she meet someone along the way? The police really have to keep their minds open for all possibilities. She was seemingly moving forward in her life, possibly without Lawrence. It was something she clearly wanted to do. That's the way Lisa was. She got very swept up in the romance and the idea of being in love. That was a big red flag for the investigators on this case. Mm -hmm. 
any romantic interest is going to be a person of interest to the police when someone goes missing. What was that relationship? Was it a relationship that was kept secret? The Caroline County Sheriff's Department may be one step closer to finding Lisa Godenzi. Love letters suggest that Lisa is having an affair with a man named Israel. It became obvious that Lisa had met an individual down in Florida. She met him on a break that she had from her military training. They used to go dancing and, and things like that, which kind of made you wonder that maybe she had run off with Israel. Israel, I can't sleep. Probably because all I have done for the past four days is sleep. Also, because I lay awake thinking of things I want to ask you and of things I want to talk to you about and thinking about us. I don't care where we live or even if we have to sleep on a couch as long as we can sleep together. Lisa wrote to Israel several times, very lengthy letters about missing him and future plans they might make and how wonderful life would be. So what do you want to do when I come down for the weekend? I would love to just lock ourselves in a room for a few days, but I do want to make plans for us to do something with Leah. Until then, love, Lisa. Two days after Lisa vanished, police find Israel at his home in Florida. When Israel was interviewed, it was evident that he had no knowledge or no part of Lisa's disappearance. The police determined that this was not that serious of a relationship, that he had been in Florida and had nothing to do with Lisa since she had been there for Christmas other than receiving her letters. Back in Virginia, the sheriff's department interviews the Godenzi's basement tenant. The basement tenant was there the last evening that Lawrence and Lisa were together in the home. The basement tenant backed Lawrence's story up that they were indeed home together and that Lawrence had left with Lisa to take her to officer training school. The sheriff's department accepted the basement tenant's word and viewed it more as a missing person's case than something that needed further investigating. Lisa's family fears this might be more than a missing person's case. Neighbors aren't so sure. When this case first began, it was really more about the community wrapping itself around Lawrence, who was the victim of this woman who ran off and broke his heart and left him as a single parent. News of Lisa's disappearance quickly reaches her first husband, Jim. Two days after Lisa disappeared, Jim Burdett comes to Caroline County to visit with Lawrence. Lawrence made it clear to Jim Burdett that he believed that Lisa was going to take their daughter, Shelby, with her, like she had done with taking Leah from Jim Burdett. I think that Lawrence and Jim Burdett established some kind of bond over their shared dismay of having a broken relationship with Lisa Mardo. Those two go to court for custody of the girls, and we hire an attorney. We fought for both girls, and we got actual physical custody of Leah and only phone visitation with Shelby. That's what we wind up with. We were just amazed that this was happening. Lawrence starts over with his daughter, Shelby, and without Lisa. Meanwhile, the search for the missing mom stalls. Joe and Nancy Mardo called that sheriff's department quite a bit and begged and begged and begged them to investigate. And Joe and Nancy Mardo were 
were really met with a brick wall. The sheriff's department in Caroline County told us there's not much they can do. She's over 18. She can do what she wants. We talked to Lawrence. She's done this before. Well, yeah, she did it before, but everybody knew where she was. It wasn't like she disappeared off the face of the earth. Joe Marto was mounting a campaign, hired his own private investigator, posted signs all over Caroline County, all near the bus station in Richmond. Have you seen this woman? He was actively trying to investigate the matter and was very frustrated that the sheriff's office wasn't doing anything. We wanted to know something. It just wasn't moving fast enough. We weren't getting any answers from the sheriff's department. The private investigator, he put up missing pictures of her. They talked to different neighbors. The private investigator said that the house should be searched, but they don't have enough probable cause. The ground should be searched, but they don't have enough probable cause. We never became complacent about it. The night we'd go to sleep, we'd have a pen and paper on, on our nightstand in case we thought of something in the middle of the night. It just never left. It never went away. She would have never run off and abandoned those two girls. The Army ended up dishonorably discharging Lisa because she didn't show up for training. And that can be an example of the police saying, well, the Army is treating it as if she didn't show up. So how do we know what really happened in this case? Soon there's more bad news for the Bartos. We tried calling Lawrence to talk to him, and he changed his phone number. Change the phone number, change the name on the account. That's when the ball started to roll. Joe and Nancy Mardo pushed so hard that the sheriff's department finally conceded and said they would bring Lawrence Cadenzi in for a polygraph test. They contacted Lawrence Cadenzi, who said, no problem, I will come in for a polygraph test. And they scheduled it. At first, he agreed. He didn't show up. His excuse was he was sick. It ended up occurring as he left town. Nobody knew where he went, no forwarding address. He disappeared off the face of the earth and took our granddaughter with him. Caroline County is a very rural, small area with a small police department and they just did not have the resources to investigate and now look for Lawrence and Shelby. So they decided ultimately to turn it over to the state police. There was enough information to take a fresh look at this case. Joe and Nancy Mardo had established a really good relationship with the detectives who were investigating this case. And they took Joe and Nancy very seriously, and they really began investigating from scratch. The state police, in investigating the disappearance of Lisa Gadenzi, uh, found that a lot of what Lawrence was saying in his original version about dropping her off the bus station uh, didn't make sense. When Lisa disappeared, Investigators didn't focus on Lawrence or his story. Now that he's also vanished, they take a second look. He had dropped her off at a bus station in Richmond to take a bus to Fort Lee. The problem with that story is it's a 45-minute drive from where Lawrence was living to the bus station in Richmond. It was only another 30 minutes to Fort Lee. Why would you drive someone 45 minutes to a bus station to take a half hour bus trip? State police are determined to question the elusive Lawrence Godenzi and find his missing daughter, Shelby. The state police made a deal with a news station in Richmond to run this story and to show a picture of Lawrence Cadenzi and, and ask the public for their assistance with any leads. They almost immediately got a tip, and the tipster who called said that they definitely recognized this person, but that was not Lawrence Cadenzi. 
they knew him as Randy Evans. Randy Evans is a local man who lives on the streets. Police find him at a shopping center. The agent said, are you Lawrence Galdenzi? He said, no, my name is Randy Lee Evans. He had a beard that looked very much like Randy Evans. He had a brace on his hand, just like Randy Evans had always had. Lawrence has a tattoo, a very distinctive tattoo on his chest, and he asked this man he's talking to, can you take your shirt off so I can see if you have any tattoos? And sure enough, there's the, the tattoo that Lawrence Cadenzi had. This was Lawrence Cadenzi posing as Randy Evans. Lawrence's story was that he gave Randy Evans a car, I think it was a Chevelle or maybe a Mustang, and $10,000 for his identification. That's how he got all of this information on Randy Evans. You know, it's kind of funny that Randy Evans was never seen again either. He's, uh, he's gone. It became clear that Lawrence had established a new life and a new identity for himself. Lawrence Cadenzi told the police that he had become Randy Evans because he thought Joe Mardo had put a hit out on him. When Joe and Nancy Marto were told that Lawrence Cadenzi was informing police and investigators that they had put a hit out on him, they laughed and found it utterly ridiculous. Lawrence was nuts. We were just amazed that this was happening. Police arrest a now remarried Lawrence Cadenzi for identity theft and for violating his probation on a weapons charge. When we heard that he saw the new life and he had a new wife, we were livid, absolutely livid. I got on the computer, I pulled up all this information. We got a marriage license on him under the name of Randy Lee Evans. He married Linda May. Police also want to know about his four-year-old daughter, Shelby. He changed Shelby's name to Logan Evans, and the three of them were living not that far away from where he left, uh, about one county over in Rockingham County. My name is Logan Dorenzo, and I am the daughter of Lisa and Lawrence. When my dad went to jail, Linda May sat me down and said, I'm not your birth mother. Your birth mother is Lisa Marto. It wasn't weird for me to find out Linda May was not my birth mother. I didn't look like her. I didn't act like her. It kind of made me love her more because she chose to love me. I was really confused. I didn't understand how Lisa could have left me. I didn't like her as a person. I hated her for abandoning me because that's all I knew. When Linda May told me all of this, she definitely said it in a way that she knew what was going on, but she didn't really want to tell me, and it was very scary to her. She seemed scared as she's telling me all of this. Lawrence Cadenzi could be very charming and cooperative and present himself as a very quiet, pious family man. But there was definitely another side to Lawrence Cadenzi. Lawrence's new wife was interviewed by state police agents and was asked what she knew about Lisa's disappearance. She related to them that Lawrence had told her that she had run off with somebody else. As Linda May and Logan detail their life with Lawrence, a disturbing picture emerges. From day to day, you never knew what kind of mood my dad was going to be in. He had a temper that is second to none. When I was in second grade, I cut my hair to my ears because that's the way I wanted it. And when I came home, my dad completely lost it and he tried to tear down the bedroom door. I loved the way I looked. I thought it was fun. And for him to 
just completely break me down over it killed me. Patterns of Lawrence's behavior extend back to his previous marriage to Lisa. Shortly before the actual wedding ceremony, Nancy, Mardo, and Lisa were together, and Nancy saw that Lisa had some significant bruises on her legs. Had said to her, if Lawrence is beating on you, you and the two girls pack your bags and you come home with Joe and I. And she said, oh no, Lawrence wouldn't allow it. We didn't know how bad it was. Lawrence Cadenzi pleads guilty to forgery and is sentenced to two years in prison. He's released in 2004. Police can't charge Lawrence in connection to Lisa's disappearance. With no new leads or evidence, the case of the missing mom goes as cold as an old Virginia coal mine. Going through those years not knowing what happened was hard. Her birthday wasn't easy for Joe, but we trudged through a lot of crying, a lot of uh, upset. I put a website up for Lisa. I did an interview on the internet. We wrote to John Walsh, American Most Wanted, numerous times, and the same letter came back. They didn't want to pick it up. We had a psychic from New Jersey. I even wrote to the president of the United States at the time, asking for his help. We left no stone unturned. We knew Lisa was dead. We knew Lawrence killed her. We had no evidence, no forensics, nothing. Nobody wanted to tackle that thing until Spencer got elected. I was the elected Commonwealth's attorney of Caroline County beginning on January 1, 2008. I had a lot on my plate. I was new to the job. And I got a phone call from a man named Joe Marto. I am a believer that a good prosecutor will not shy away from tough cases. We set up a meeting with Joe Marto and his wife. And by the time that meeting was over, I was convinced that this was a case that I, I was interested in having investigated and prosecuted. It seems highly unlikely that a woman about to embark on a career in the military is going to leave her husband without a divorce for another man, going to leave two children behind, is going to basically give up what is, you know, sort of a lifelong dream to just disappear. What I found in my investigation was that Lisa was a highly intelligent young lady she wanted to better herself, and we knew something was wrong. She hasn't renewed her driver's license. She hasn't renewed her insurance. She hasn't done anything else that normal people do in the daily life. None of that occurred. It just stopped. Sometimes nothing is something. Lisa just didn't disappear, fall off the face of the earth. Her life revolved around those two little girls. Lisa had a plan, and the plan wasn't to disappear. This is not someone who is probably missing. This is someone who was murdered. Everything about Lisa's life stopped. It looks like we may have the facts to be able to prove a murder here. When police and prosecutors don't have a body, they don't have any information. So police and prosecutors then have to rely on other types of evidence. They came up with a team of five investigators, and they fanned out. They went to Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, Maine, Texas, Virginia, and re-interviewed everybody. And he heard wildly different versions of what Lawrence had told them had happened to Lisa. 
Lawrence said Lisa had run off with a truck driver from Indiana. In another version, Lawrence said that she had run off with a man of Florida. The only thing that we had was a history of Lawrence's lies, the lies that he had told over the years about what happened to Lisa. We got an uphill battle here. Agents in Florida want to talk to Lisa's first husband, Jim Burdett, who's now homeless. I traveled to the last known area that Jim Burdett could have been at. And we went to the drive through McDonald's and got him a meal and went back to the sheriff's office. We sit there in a conference room. He has his briefcase. I am so curious of what's in that briefcase. Why would this homeless man be carrying around a briefcase in 104 degrees on a road in the middle of nowhere? So I open it up. What do I find? I find a plethora of tapes. Jim Burdett recorded his conversations with anybody that had anything to do with Lisa, hoping there might be something in there that he could use in his custody battle. One of them was a cassette of Lawrence talking to Jim Burdett two days after Lisa disappeared, and it's fascinating. Lawrence is explaining yet again another version of what happened. She, she didn't want to stay with me anymore. She wanted to go to Fort Lee. You can hear him trying his stories out. You can hear him trying to dig information out of Jim Burdett that he can use. And it was a critical piece of evidence in the case. When you have this audio tape of Lawrence Gadenzi's voice in January of 1995 talking about it, you can't argue with that. Looking to bolster their case, investigators interview Diane, who used to babysit the Gadenzi's daughter, Shelby, back in Virginia. Lisa and Lawrence called Diane to babysit the weekend before Lisa was supposed to report to Fort Lee. Lawrence was excited for her to come home, so they took Shelby over to the babysitter. During that time, Diane and Lisa have a conversation, and Lisa tells her that she wants to get a divorce from Lawrence. I believe that Lawrence heard Lisa tell the babysitter, Diane, that she was going to leave Lawrence, that Lawrence was afraid that Lisa was going to take Shelby away from him, just like she had taken Leah away from Jim Burdett. We have a classic triggering event. He's going to lose control of his wife, but more importantly, he's going to lose control over the most important thing in his life, which is his daughter. You start putting circumstances together, and it all starts going down the same road that Lawrence, more than likely, killed Lisa. With a possible motive established, they look for evidence at the home Lawrence and Lisa once shared. I go in the closet door and I notice that the drywall, there's been some, some type of work done there. I had pulled the carpet up and there was just a gigantic red stain. It looked like blood. So I conducted a luminol it looked like the biggest blue light you've ever seen. I swabbed it. We brought it to the lab. They said, we can't say it's blood. But what we can tell you is there's a whole lot of Clorox there. Agent Collins goes down to Georgia and locates the downstairs tenant that was living in the basement at the time of uh, Lisa's disappearance. Early on, they did interview the basement tenants, and the woman who lived in the basement essentially said that she hadn't seen anything unusual. They say people's memories fade. That's true. But if it's an event that occurred in their life that's very dramatic, they remember details for years and years and years. So we were looking to pull out those details. She's sitting on the couch. She has her head down. And she starts to rock. And it gets to the point where she is rocking almost uncontrollably. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm afraid that Lawrence will come try to kill me.
I was at home taking a shower. The phone rings, and I look, and I see that it's T.C. Collins. So I answer it. And I'll never forget T.C. saying, I've got the smoking gun. Lawrence Cadenzi's former tenant tells Agent Collins about the night before Lisa vanished. She says that the ground was frozen. It was been cold for several days. She was out there smoking a cigarette. Lawrence didn't know that she had seen him come out of the top floor deck and carrying a big green bag that he could hardly carry. He went out for about 10 minutes into the woods and came back and didn't have the bag with him. The tenant says Lawrence left the house in a hurry. Once he was gone, she went inside and noticed a trail of dirt leading to a bedroom upstairs. She had a friend with her at the time. They come in the bedroom, and they see all of Lisa's military gear all laid out. They walk into the bathroom, and all they see is a bunch of blood. They are scared to death. So they lock the door and go back downstairs. She was still so petrified all these years later. She was afraid of Lawrence. I don't know what he told her, but I do know that uh, this fear was real. And that's why she hadn't come forward before. This is the part that we needed. And I remember thinking that pretty much seals this case. It was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and the phone rings, and I looked at the clock, and I says, my intuition, I said, it's Spencer. And sure enough, it was. Nancy, we just arrested Lawrence for the murder of Lisa. I jumped up and down. I was so happy that we were going to have some type of closure to this. We decided to indict him for murder and the police went and arrested him. He was in shackles, and we sat right there. And we looked right at him. He seen us. He didn't know what to do. He knew. We wanted him to know it was us that was involved and brought him down. The Caroline County prosecutor had a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence. Jim Burdett's tapes and the basement tenant's eyewitness account proved damning. Just two days into the trial, Lawrence pleads guilty to second degree murder and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. The mystery surrounding the disappearance of the drifter Randy Evans remains an open investigation. Joe and I were relieved that Lawrence finally was found guilty. We weren't happy that we didn't know where Lisa's remains were. We still wanted to know what happened to Lisa, what happened to her body. So Doc Lyons and T.C. Collins went to see Lawrence in prison and said, look, if you can tell us where Lisa's body is, we might be able to convince the prosecutor to agree to a sentence reduction. What Lawrence said happened was that he and Lisa had been arguing at the top of the steps and that he had grabbed Lisa. She pulled away from him and fell down the steps and broke her neck. He was afraid he would be charged with murder, and so he just decided uh, instead to just get rid of the body and pretend that she had gone missing. I do not believe that Lisa was killed the way Lawrence likes to paint the pretty picture of, it was an accident, I've seen my dad angry, and I just don't believe it. Uh, he had told us that when he dropped her off in this field, he put her in a 50-gallon drum with muriatic acid.
After 15 years, the remains of Lisa Guadenzi have finally been found. Just one year into his 25 year jail sentence, Lawrence Guadenzi is talking for the first time, leading police here to Spotsylvania County. So we pull down in this field. Well, we find what looks like a, a lot of synthetic material that comes out of a sleeping bag. I look off to the right, and literally there's three bottles of muriatic acid that's been there for 15, 20 years. Not far from the acid bottles, investigators find something telling. It was Lisa Bartos' dental bridge. And it's the only uh, human remains of, of Lisa that there are. And, uh, but they were at least uh, able to, to find some remains and, and uh, give the family some closure. We have done the best we could uh, to provide them at least we know where the resting place of their daughter is. State police say Lawrence Godenzi had hoped his cooperation would help reduce his 25-year jail sentence, but it won't. We had a memorial at the military cemetery, and they had gun salute. They had a flyover. They had a minister there. Beautiful service, absolutely beautiful. We were happy that we got the partial. Uh, we were happy that we were able to put it to a headstone. We lobbied the army to change her name back to her main name. We were free. I lived with a murderer for 13 years. I will never have the relationship I should have with my sister of growing up and driving her crazy and all of the things. And it definitely changed everything. Through the whole process, we grieved a lot, not just when it was over, this was a big part of our life every day. Nobody should have to go through this.